a few years ago or even six months ago at the beginning of May, who predicted that today we would be discussing a movement which had an insurrectionary mood in the US, a movement which would force the president into hiding in an underground bunker in the White House. Who would have thought that said movement would begin here in my hometown, practically in my neighborhood in Minneapolis? Just last year, in 2019, we watched revolutionary movements happen around the world in Chile, Ecuador, Sudan, Lebanon, uh, all over in, in a red October. Uh, nearly 25% of countries had some sort of civil unrest in 2019, such as the French Gilets Jaunes, the Yellow Vests, and the protests in Hong Kong. And here in the US, I think at the time, some of us felt a little left out. Uh, like, where is our social explosion? In 2019, in November, a uh, year ago, almost to the day, a Socialist Revolution editorial stated that the US working class and youth will not be far behind our sisters and brothers around the world. The molecular process of revolution is percolating here in the US as well. I think it is very fair to say that we got our social explosion this summer with the George Floyd movement. Not only did this movement reach hundreds of US cities and even small towns, but it even spread internationally to countries like Britain, Belgium, Italy, and, and Canada, among others, with shocking speed. An estimated one in 10 Americans participated directly in the protests over the summer. And as we've heard the statistics cited a couple of times, 50% of Americans, over 50%, thought that burning down the third precinct was justified. This movement was, was far reaching and will leave a lasting impact. I am going to attempt to outline some lessons that we as Marxists can learn from it. And I, I heavily focus on Minneapolis uh, since most of the details I am familiar with on the, on the ground here are, are from Minneapolis. But I hope in the discussion we'll be able to get a broader picture of this movement as well. The George Floyd uprising did not come out of nowhere. That, that percolation was visible if you were paying attention. The Black Lives Matter movement goes way back to 2012 with the acquittal of George Zimmerman after he murdered a, a child, Trayvon Martin. Under the Obama administration in 2014, there was also the Ferguson protests after the murder of Michael Brown by officer Darren Wilson. These protests in Missouri saw extreme violence and repression by the state. Uh, the National Guard, Guard was called in there but they did not extend as far geographically speaking as the George Floyd movement did. We also saw here in Minnesota, the murder of Philando Castile uh, in 2016, sparking protests again that failed to ignite any unrest on the scale of what we saw this summer. There were many indications that the straws were piling up on the camel's back. So, why did this movement go as far as it did, reach as many people as this one did? Why was it that this movement merited international headlines uh, and had President Trump shaking in his boots? George Floyd's murder was the tipping point. It was the straw that broke the camel's back. These protests were not only caused by the death of one man, as unjust as his death was. George Floyd was not the first, second, but 49th murder of a black person in Minneapolis alone since the year 2000. He is not even the first black American to say, I can't breathe while having their airway blocked by a cop, since we've all become familiar with Eric Garner's last words. America is hardly the exception when it comes to police terror either. Violence and repression from the state is something the whole world proletariat has experienced. The city of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, for example, had over 150 people killed by police every month 
last year in 2019. Last week, as was mentioned in the earlier session, uh, earlier session, one of our comrades in Pakistan was abducted by state forces, as this is a regular occurrence. Amar Fayez, uh, and we are currently campaigning for his release, do send solidarity messages. A reason that these protests spread so quickly internationally was because of this common experience the working class of the world has. And it's not just the police terror. It is the systemic racism which has led to the poverty of Black people in the US. It's the pandemic, which has two times the death rate for Blacks than whites. It's the global economic crisis. In the US, we were offered a measly like 1200 bucks once, or at least some of us were, after we watched a trillion dollars disappear like magic into the stock market. This is a unique economic crisis we are in, which the rich have actually become richer while millions are still unemployed. So much for we're all in this together, it, this movement is, in reality, the product of a global capitalist system in crisis. These other factors that have been building up uh, showed themselves in the slogans and speeches at the protests. In LA, over the summer, people marching through Beverly Hills shouted, eat the rich. Uh, in, capital, in the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone in Seattle, uh, they had demands that were very explicitly of a class character. And here in Minneapolis, people quickly connected the struggle against police brutality with the questions of housing, unemployment, and healthcare. There was an anger that would not be contained until the pandemic was over. A justified anger that had been built up over decades and accelerated by the latest economic crisis in the pandemic. You could say that this movement had really been building up over the centuries of racial oppression this country has perpetuated. Marxists, contrary to some misconceptions, do not reduce everything to, to a class basis and we do not ignore or neglect the fight against systems of oppression. On the contrary, it is our responsibility to understand systems of oppression, their roots, their causes and effects, so that we can fight for the liberation of all of humanity. Marxists take a materialist view of history, which means we see that racism has not always existed and it does not have to exist forever. It is, it's out of the scope of this discussion to give a complete history of, of racism in the US, but I think it is important to point out um, racial discrimination was a product of capitalism and the expansion of capitalism and the slave trade into the new world. The concept of a white race, in contrast to other races, only really started to take shape in America after Bacon's Rebellion, in which black and white slaves and indentured servants formed a militia together. The slave owners and propertied class saw the necessity of dividing the exploited classes across race lines in order to continue conquering them. Propaganda was intentionally disseminated throughout the white indentured servants to create a divide to convince them that they did not have the same interests as the black slaves, that the black slaves were not even human. The exploited class, the exploiting class dangled some extra crumbs in front of the white servants and enticed them with a social status just above that of black slaves. The police, of course, have played an important role in maintaining this racial divide within the working class in the US starting from the beginning with their role as slave catchers. In order to create this division in the exploited classes, the ruling class not only needed the carrot to offer selectively to white workers and servants, but also the stick to beat against those that fraternized across race lines. The police and the laws they enforce are not neutral. The law serves the interests of the ruling class to maintain their rule. In capitalism, where the capitalist class are right, the oppressed and the exploited proletariat, they need a special armed body to enforce those laws, and they need to use the tactic of divide and conquer as much as possible. <laughs> 
In the words of Malcolm X, you can't have capitalism without racism. You can learn this from a book or you can learn this from experience. This summer, millions across the US learned in a matter of weeks what it might take years of reading and studying in, in normal, less eventful times to learn. In the first two weeks of protests, I watched as people I knew went from leading very apolitical lives to denouncing the real looters in society, not the protesters taking basic necessities from big businesses, but rather the big corporations who profited during a pandemic when so many people were left unemployed and hungry. The same people who maybe two years ago would have spoken about the need to increase police funding in order to buy body cameras and give the police diversity training, those people were now discussing the idea of defunding or even abolishing the police because they saw firsthand the role the police play in society as peaceful vigils were interrupted with tear gas as journalists were shot at. I'd already read uh, State and Revolution by Lenin long before this summer's events occurred. Uh, but for those who haven't read it, this book really explains that the state, fundamentally an armed body made up of the police and military, is a tool used by one class to repress another. In blunt, clear language, Lenin explains why the capitalist state cannot be reformed for socialists to use it must be abolished and replaced with a worker state of our own. I highly suggest anyone listening who hasn't read it to put it on their list. Uh, but personally, seeing kids share pictures of the bruises on their face and bodies from rubber bullets, kids that I know that I used to coach in, in youth sports leagues, that experience brands the real nature of the state into your head. It makes reforming the police sound like a joke. Without having to, to read a page of Lenin, uh, police terror is something that people of color and people in the poorest neighborhoods have been enduring in an atomized way for a long time. But suddenly, with the explosion of this movement, practically the whole city of Minneapolis was going through this experience together. And in fact, cities across the US uh, were watching this live or, or experiencing it on the street themselves. And they were drawing conclusions from it. At a national level, the support for the Black Lives Matter movement jumped by 28 percentage points in just two weeks, which is more than an increase in the previous 21 months. Out on the streets were people of every background and ethnicity. The instinct people had uh, and spoke of was one of unity, strength in numbers, and solidarity. Division started to fall away and diversity was celebrated in the streets. And everyone was, was engaged in trying to solve the problem of how to change society. This was demonstrated in the organizing of neighborhood committees and patrols in many different pockets of the city to keep the streets safe from the justified but less controlled rage from the youth or from the violence of the far right, which was uh, a rumored threat, and from provocateurs in their midst that the police used to justify their harsh repression. The rapid deployment of cleanup crews, food donations, and, and patrols demonstrated that the workers and youth of Minneapolis were beginning to learn that maybe they could run society themselves without the bosses or the police. The protests actually were more effective at distributing masks and enforcing their use on the streets than the government had been for the whole pandemic. The evidence of this was seen in that even two weeks after the protests had erupted, there, was, there wasn't a spike in cases of COVID-19 that you might have expected. The masses were learning through experience that they can only depend on their own forces to protect themselves from violence, since the state's armed forces will be sent to shoot them down while protecting the far right, or for truthful reporting, since the capitalist owned press falsely focuses on looting and destruction of private property as the real crimes, as opposed to the police violence 
for distributing masks and food and even housing since the capitalists will openly speculate and protect their profits during a pandemic. When the movement spread to city after city after city, the media could no longer claim that participants in the protests were all from out of state as they had tried to do at first. The momentum of the movement was propelled forward with the murders of Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Aubrey. Local governments and Trump's administration became increasingly desperate for a way to quell the movement. They tried to alternate between concessions and repression, hoping the movement would be satisfied with a few crumbs or would be beaten into submission. Their concessions, though, amounted to empty declarations and renaming streets. Uh, or painting Black Lives Matter or the names of those killed on the streets, which fooled absolutely no one. And for their repression, they tried tear gas, they tried rubber bullets, and they called in the National Guard. But there weren't enough cops anywhere in the country to suppress this movement. And even the National Guard, when they were called in, was soon exhausted, overworked, and demoralized, in many cases ashamed if their family found out where they were being deployed to. Another tactic they used was to delay the proceedings for the trials of the officers that killed George Floyd until April 2021, 20, I think, in, in the hopes that everyone would get swept up in the day-to-day -day grind soon enough and forget about it. On to the next news cycle. But when the police didn't stop their terror, it only re-sparked the movement, as we saw in Kenosha, Wisconsin, with the hospitalization of Jacob Blake. It's worth noting that Trump also threatened to call in the army to squash the protests, but immediately he was met with defiance from his own administration and generals. The National Guard is one thing, but they knew that deploying the army domestically would only serve to throw kerosene on an open flame. The rank and file military is full of people conscripted by the poverty draft, with blacks and Latinos highly represented among the ranks. Trump might be dumb enough to think they would have all obeyed his every command, but the smart wing of the capitalist class was not so confident and knew there was a strong possibility the soldiers may prefer to turn around and shoot their own officers rather than at a crowd that their family, their community could be marching with. There are two lessons regarding state repression, I think, that the George Floyd movement gave us and that every political activist fighting against police terror should learn well. The first is that a real mass movement can go up against the state and hold its own. Some people uh, might lament about how, how many tanks the U.S. government has, how many weapons are in their armory, and saying a revolution could not hope to ever beat such a heavily equipped, re massive repressive body. But you need people to drive those tanks and people to shoot those guns, and a mass movement will sweep the masses up into it. Such a movement with a revolutionary leadership could potentially aim to win over those in the armed forces until there aren't enough people in the uniform left for the capitalist class to arm against a, a revolution. The second lesson is this. The slogan calling to abolish the police is insufficient for the task we have before us. Ultimately, yes, we are fighting for a police-free society. The calls in the movement for abolishing the police show that the instinct people had was that this was a tool of repression that could not be reformed. That it was not just a few bad apples, but the very system that was the problem. But how do we get there to a police-free society from where we are right now? What steps are in between? After the burning down of the third precinct, uh, when there were many marches that were circling the fifth precinct that was starting to look flammable, the Minneapolis City Council announced that they would be disbanding the police department. I'll go into this more in a second, but spoiler, that's not going to happen. If the Minneapolis Police Department did disband, uh, was disbanded, what would that mean? Uh, it would mean that 
St. Paul, the St. Paul Police Department, probably, uh, which is a city that borders Minneapolis, and the county police would get a larger juris jurisdiction. They would have more responsibility, more area to cover. Private security would suddenly have more power, uh, and the National Guard may be deployed more often. Abolishing the police in one city, one county at a time is, is not the path forward to ending police terror, to winning a world without police in it. After the announcement to disband the police, the all-Democrat city council with one Green Party council member later released their proposal for disbanding the police, which more accurately should be described as renaming the police. They then made it clear that there was absolutely no time to add this proposal to the ballot in this election. So even renaming the police will have to wait until next year, 2022. In a very skillful maneuver, these politicians on the city council were able to twist the slogan of abolishing the police uh, into something that which ultimately they could lead right into a dead end, only to completely go back on their words. <clears throat> The slogan was just vague enough that Democrats could convert it into something harmless until the movement could lose momentum. The slogan painted a picture of a utopia without paving the road to get there. Without abolishing capitalism, you can't hope to abolish the forces that the capitalist class uses to defend its power. Because it doesn't specifically challenge capitalism, that's why it was easily co-opted. The system in systemic racism is capitalism, and that needs to be addressed. In Minneapolis, it was the neighborhood committees and patrols that protected the buildings and stores that people depended on from arson, looting, and the threat of the far right. To a large extent, these patrols were organized by the NAACP and AIM, the American Indian Movement, but some neighborhoods organized their patrols just going off their example, letting the police know they would be breaking curfew uh, that was issued by the governor. The IMT in Minneapolis participated in the movement energetically and, and put forward the idea of strengthening these patrols and committees and linking them up with the unions to strengthen the movement as a whole. <clears throat> Labor and the ability to withhold it is where the working class's power really lies. Union workers were already out in the streets to show their support. I saw nurses, teachers, and, and postal workers, despite the fact that several post offices had been burned down in some of the riots. A glimpse of what a revived labor movement can accomplish is what we saw with the transit workers in Minneapolis when they refused to transport cops or arrested protesters with their, their buses. The unions could have strengthened the neighborhood committees and prepared for a general strike. This could have brought justice for every victim of police terror against the whole police department, uh, against the National Guard and, and Minnesota government as a whole in a flash. A general strike would pose the question of which class really holds power in society. Unfortunately, most union leadership limited themselves to public statements vaguely calling for action and justice without saying what that would look like when justice is defined by those who write and enforce the racist oppressive laws. The one demand the union leadership did put forward was for the resignation of Bob Kroll, the union president in Minneapolis, the police union president. He is undoubtedly a hated, hated irredeemable figure. Uh, he's called Black Lives Matter activists terrorists. Uh, but in the same statement, these unions called for systemic change without any kind of elaboration. So the resignation of one cop does not change the system. And an opportunity, I feel, was lost here by the union leadership because they were not prepared to take up this fight against police terror and against capitalism in earnest. The slogans we raised were to strengthen the patrol committees, link them up with the unions, and start preparing for a general strike. 
I saw graffiti in Minneapolis that said community patrol for our safety, which showed that people did see the patrols as theirs, and something they could use to protect themselves. The neighborhood committees and, and patrols had the potential to be really organized by the unions with elected leadership directly accountable to their neighbors. Uh, they could have been expanded from there to include all the cities which had protests, who had their own victims of police brutality that they were fighting for. They could be used by the people to defend themselves against police brutality and state repression. Imagine if the cowards with guns in Kenosha uh, who shot at protesters had to deal with an organized force of workers and youth instead of just the tail end of a leerless, organizationless protest. Imagine if every time a cop tried to stop and frisk a black kid in New York or pulled over someone with their taillight out in Minnesota, you had 20 to 30 people in every neighborhood ready to observe and prepared to intervene. How many lives would be saved that way even before the police could be abolished? <clears throat> the Minneapolis uprising is a product in some ways of the backwardness of American politics. We do not have a mass labor party as we went over in the last discussion, no mass socialist parties that we could vote for in this past election. But instead we have two wings of the capitalist class which take turns posing as the friend of workers only to screw us over and hand power back to the other wing in a spirit of bipartisanship. Bernie Sanders betrayed his supporters and endorsed Joe Biden, author of the crime bill, friend of segregationists, and who said at the height of these protests that the cops should shoot them in the leg instead. Minnesota and Minneapolis have already been voting for this party of the lesser evil for decades. The state and local governments both have been consistently blue since at least the 1960s. Minnesota elected Ilhan Omar as representative, and there's record of progressive Democrats holding offices. And it is this Democratic Party which has overseen the racial inequality and police brutality we've had for so long in this city. It was the blue state of Minnesota that called on the National Guard and implemented a curfew, restricting our First Amendment right. And uh, as an important update to the situation in Minneapolis, just yesterday, the city council, again, all Democrat with one green, voted seven to six to approve, approve additional funding for the police department and additional officers uh, to bring in from the county since so many police officers retired or quit because of the George Floyd uprising. Some of the same city council members who had called for dismantling the police voted for this budget increase. I hear sometimes that local Demo Democrats are supposed to be more progressive, but based on the experience of Minneapolis, I would caution against such a belief. Minneapolis is a haven for progressive Democrats, and even here uh, at the heart of the George Floyd movement, this, it's not enough to push these Democrats far enough left to consider defunding the police. Anyone running as a Democrat and looking to use the resources of the Democratic Party to gain a larger platform will have to stay far away from any action that challenges racist capitalism because the Democratic Party is a capitalist party. At one protest, I listened to Congresswoman Ilhan Omar give a, a great speech saying that the system could not be reformed, and that, that's almost a direct quote. Everyone in the crowd was quiet, listening very closely to catch her words, and she spoke for 30 minutes on how difficult it was to be Black in this country, how cruel and un unjust the system is to immigrants, to homeless people, to the mentally ill, and she said that reforms don't work. And that was it. Uh, that was the end of the speech. It felt very unfinished and there was a sense of, of dissatisfaction when I was there. Because there is no conclusion for how to change the system. If reforming it will not work, which we agree with Ilhan Omar, it won't, what do we do? What is the path forward then to a society free of police terror? The Black Lives Matter movement has no political party. The millions of workers and youth that participated 
in this movement saw no candidates addressing their demands. Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey, Jamar Clark, Philando Castile, Michael Brown, Eric Garner, Trayvon Martin, and all the victims of police terror whose names we don't know because their murders were not caught on camera. There was no candidate fighting for justice for them in these elections. The exploited and the oppressed have no party fighting for their interests. But as was covered in the last discussion a little, that does not mean forever be content to be divided into interest groups and vote for capitalist parties. The backwardness of American politics has begun to turn into its opposite. The masses saw no way forward through waiting for the elections this fall, so they directly took to the streets this summer. People wanted to change the system, and yet there's no political leadership that has system change in its platform. The only leadership the movement could find, the union leadership, the Democrats to some extent, offered no path forward. And so eventually the movement ebbed. And all movements will ebb eventually. Masses of people do not have infinite energy to take to the streets day after day forever. Without any sort of leadership to indicate which direction it should go in, any movement will gradually disperse over time. We need a leadership that clearly understands that the system that needs changing is capitalism. We need a leadership that has participated in movements like the Minneapolis Uprising and learned from that experience. What is needed is an organization made up of people that have been trained in these lessons from every experience of the historical class struggle and fighting against oppression and state repression. We need a leadership that is fighting for socialist revolution. The international Marxist tendency is building in cities all across the US, including here in Minneapolis, looking to recruit from all layers of the workers and youth that were inspired by the George Floyd movement and who are incensed by the terror inflicted by the capitalist system onto the poor and oppressed. I'm looking forward to the rest of the discussion and I'll do my best to answer any questions that you put in the chat uh, at the end. And finally, I hope the discussions over the course of the weekend inspire those of you who are not yet members of the IMT and help us build a revolutionary socialist organization.